I want to talk to you guys about the Marantz Amp 10 16 channel power amplifier. It does something that no other amplifier that I've measured in Audio Halt's history does. That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delisello with Audio Hawks. As you guys know, I'm reviewing the Marantz Amp 10 and the AV10 matching products, the separates, as you can see right here. I've been doing some videos on them. I recently did the AV10 uh, 15.4 channel bench test results. And now we're looking at the Amp 10, which is a 200 watt by 16 channel power amplifier. And there's some very cool features about this amplifier. And in fact, it's an industry first for Marantz to do such a high channel count in one amplifier that's not just a distribution amp. But the fact that they used a, a class D amplification for an audiophile product on all these channels is really quite interesting that they're making this jump. And they've done some innovation here. And I want to go over it with you in my test report, which is published on audiohawks.com. I'll link it up down below, but I want to go over those results with you because sometimes graphs and numbers, you got to get a better tangible feel for what it all means and whether it's just academic or if there's things that really matter for sound quality. So I'm going to share my screen here with you and I'm going to go to the test report and I just want to go over this stuff with you. So the retail on the Amp 10 is $7,000 and you get 16 channels and rated at 200 watts a channel. So I started out basically saying, you know, up until the Amp 10 came out, if you wanted to get 16 channels of amplification, you'd have to use three boxes from Marantz. And the cost would be, you know, well over $5,000 to do that. And you'd want to put less power. So the fact that they have an amplifier that has 16 channels in a relatively light chassis that only weighs about 50 pounds or 48 pounds, something like that, and it's an honestly rated 200 watts by 16, it's quite a bargain when you think about it. When you think about the price of this, it sounds expensive at first, but what, what you're getting, and if you're doing a high channel count Atmos system, let's see if the performance warrants the price because you're going to be quite surprised, I think. So we start out just talking about the amp topology. It's, it's, the, it's the Ice Edge. It's their latest power module, and it's quite um, a flexible amplifier. It could be it could be used in very high power applications if you give enough voltage for it, or it could be used at lower power. Marantz is kind of in the middle here at 200 watts. And they also have another first for them. They have an SMPS power supply in a multi-channel amplifier. Now you can see there's a toroid. Uh, if you look at the inside of this amplifier, I'm going to jump around a little bit here. You can see that Marantz toroid. That's not for the uh, power modules. That's actually for the HDAM circuits and the preamp input drives and, and other various circuits. So some people I saw on the forum saying, oh, that's quite a small power supply for 16 channels. That's actually not the power supply. And I'm going to show you the power supply here. I got this from Marantz itself. And you can kind of read over those little notes. So basically, it's a large centralized SMPS power supply and it's a regulated supply. And originally we were told in the dealer trainings that we went to that they were 500 watt individual power supplies for each two channel blade. Doesn't seem to be the case. There's actually one large regulated power supply here, as you can see. And I wanted to give a shout out to Blue Jeans Cable because in order for me to get very accurate measurements, I really needed to upgrade my test fixture on my audio precision. I found this as a problem when I was testing the NAD uh, M23 amplifier, which is a super low distortion amplifier. We're talking sine ads of over 106 dB. And I had to change my connectors. My connectors on my cables were causing the sources of distortion that were measurable when you get down to this fine uh, tooth comb here with measurements. So I had Blue Jeans Cable redesign all my connectors and they used copper um, alligator clips which the other alligator clips I, clips, I think, were just like steel or something. They were really bad, very noisy. So the copper ones really cut the noise down in my very um, low-level measurements. And I also have, you know, nice terminations on them, so I won't short anything out. And then there's me kind of holding the 16-channel amplifier. Now, to put things into perspective, I'm a lot older than I was 20 years ago. And when I had their... I had Denon's uh, 15 channel, I'm sorry, 10 channel amplifier, the POA A1 HDCI. That thing weighed like 150 pounds. So I would, even though I could pick that up, I wouldn't be as comfortable as I am picking this one up. 
and this thing is like a third of the third of the weight but has more channels and in some aspects more power so here's just the top view of the amplifier again you can see um, each one of those modules there are two channels per side and then there's a SMPS power supply towards the front of the unit and then that other toroid to do the analog circuits like HDAM and the preamp buffers control and all that stuff. It's a nice layout. And then there's a copper uh, plate underneath the lower noise. I mean, they just put a lot, of, a lot of thought into this, especially with the brass connectors for the cables, which gives uh, rigidity and low noise. That's where the, all that's connected. And then I, you know, I just measured the gain with the audio precision and Morant specs it as a 29 dB uh, amplifier gain. Now the input drive, depending on if you're using the, the XLR or, or the unbalanced, you get a 6 dB difference there, which is pretty standard that I've seen amplifiers. The first thing I look at is frequency response and the test of a good amplifier is to be load invariant. So whether you're driving an eight ohm load or a four ohm load, you want the frequency response to remain relatively the same. That's usually not a problem for linear AB designs, but with class D designs that could be problematic, especially the first generation ones, the full bandwidth ones, they would be really optimized for one load impedance, let's say a four ohm load. And then when you go and put an eight ohm load on it, you get a big difference in frequency response, especially at the high frequency like you know, 20 kilohertz range. But a lot has changed since then. So now we have faster switchers, we have better feedback loops, we have better output filters. I mean, everything is kind of improving as the technology goes on. And you could see in this case, the frequency response is pretty much the same all the way out to 35, 40 kilohertz, whether I'm driving an eight ohm load or a four ohm load. So that's awesome. That means basically this amplifier is going to sound the same it's going to sound consistent whatever load impedance that you're driving just like a really good linear a b amplifier does and the bandwidth of this amp is you know i think it's like 80 kilohertz i mean it's pretty much the limit of my um measurementation my device itself so i want to show you um when i do fft distortion plots i like to look at the spectra and see how clean it is i always look at one watt because that's where the amplifier lives most of the time and you want it to be clean and you can see there's no power supply hum at all. Marantz did an incredible job. And the DC offset's really low. It's in the like, like millivolts at, when I start driving this thing. So it's really, really low. Um, but look at the 60 hertz. It's flat. There's no bump. A lot of amplifiers, especially multi-channel amplifiers, I can measure the power supply hum. Sometimes it's audible. So usually it's not if the amplifier is designed properly. But the spectra is really clear here. If you look at the uh, the third order harmonic is 113 dB below the fundamental. So that's really clean. Anything that's greater than 90 dB there is, is quite transparent. So that's awesome that we see the cleanliness of this. And I'm not even using a preconditioned filter that you should normally use for class D amplifiers. So this is just showing you that they have good filtering going on here. So here's the issue, and this is a philosophical question, and I'm going to do a separate video on. Now, this amplifier is rated at 200 watts, but in order to get that 200 watts, they're at a, a, as low as a supply voltage as they can without overheating any of their product, without overheating any of the elements that would have to be redesigned. So yes, this is a 200 watt amp, but it's low distortion. It's really low distortion profile happens below 200 watts due to the supply voltage limitation. So when I measure the FFT at 200 watts, you could see it's not great. I mean, the, the third order harmonic is still a good 75 dB below the fundamental, but there's some higher order harmonic nasties at 200 watts. Now, when I back this off to like 150 watts, it gets much cleaner. And I've seen this behavior on, on linear designs as well, linear AB designs. This is not atypical. It looks worse than it really is. But just to go, it just goes to show you that when these manufacturers are rating their amplifiers and you really have to look at the distortion curve and I'll be showing you that next to see how, if it's before the knee or after the knee, because if it's before the knee, you're not going to get this, but it's after the knee, you're going to get this. So here's the uh, power bandwidth test. And what I did was I ran the amplifier at full power bandwidth for eight ohm and four ohms. And I just wanted to show with two channels driven, I got 400 watts continuous for 10 hertz all the way to 20 kilohertz. You can see it's very linear, very stable. That's good news. But when I was driving up to seven channels, full power bandwidth, um, I noticed when I was trying to sweep seven, it didn't do this in five channels, but when I went to sweep seven, 
I started getting like a dip at the low frequencies during the sweep. And you can see that here. And then I went and spot checked it just with discrete tones and I saw the same thing. So I know that the power supply, when you're driving multiple channels continuously, is going to start dipping the low frequency powers. There's some type of limitation in there. And I know Marantz was not able to reproduce this, but they did show me a graph where there's dipped below 200 hertz. It just didn't do this beat, this big uh, dip over here that you're seeing at 70 hertz. And a lot of that depends on you know the test duration, how long the test sweep is. I tend to run longer power sweeps maybe than what's standard. I run probably about seven or 800 milliseconds when I do these sweeps. So maybe they ran a shorter sweep or you know maybe they swept the other way from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz to 20 hertz sometimes that makes a difference on the audio precision but the bottom line is with seven channels continuous drive full bandwidth there is some power limiting um at 200 watts when you're trying to get to 200 watts uh for full bandwidth testing but when we look at the power sweeps at one kilohertz this is what most of the manufacturers will will give you the rating at or actually this is what most of the magazines when they measure they typically don't do full power bandwidth. They do one kilohertz. And you could you miss stuff. You would miss this low frequency stuff that I was showing. But with that said, at one kilohertz, this thing is a beast. I mean, it did 215 watts at 0.1% and 226 watts at 1%. Now, if you look at that distortion, if you look at the bottom trace, the horizontal lines, the green and the blue lines, you can see that there, the knee starts happening at about 150 watts, 125 watts. And as I was telling you guys before, I measured the FFT at 200 watts and you're already into hard clipping. Even though 0.1% is not technically considered clipping, it's still considered pretty good fidelity. It definitely is clipping. You're running out of voltage. And that's what you see when the trace goes from horizontal to vertical. So if I would have done the FFT at 125 watts, it would be super clean. And I kind of like to be more conservative when I rate power amplifiers personally. I would have loved it if Marantz called this 150 watts times 16. And then I showed you had all this extra available power, which we can then calculate as dynamic headroom. So it's another semantic kind of way of specking things. But the bottom line is they are giving you the 200 watts with two channels driven at 0.1%. So that's really awesome. But here's the thing. Here's something that this amplifier does that I've never seen any other multi-channel amplifier do. With seven channels driven, I have the same power. 215 watts at 0.1%, 226 watts at 1%. So it doesn't matter whether I'm driving one channel, two channel, three channel, four channel, five channel, six channel, seven channel, you're getting the exact same power output. That's because the power supply is so heavily regulated that they're just keeping it locked in. So there's positive to that, the fact that you could do all channels driven and get a legit 200 watts by seven. Now, I'm not testing the 16 channels, so I know people are going to be asking me that, but it's unrealistic to try to run an all channels driven test with that many amplifiers going at once. And my AP is only capable of testing eight channels at one particular time, and I don't have enough loads to do 16 channels. Um, so this is impressive. The fact that we're getting 200 watts by seven Marantz never made a those other amps that they have on their website. They can't give this kind of power with multiple channels driven. The 150 watt amps, they have the 70% rule when you're driving five channels or more. So you're not going to get this kind of power. So this is impressive. Now, that little blip on one of those channels at, at 50, hertz, uh, 50 watts, 45 watts, that was just when I measured a module and I didn't drive the two channels in the module. It was when I was driving one channel, for some reason, it would give a little distortion blip at that point and Marantz was not able to reproduce it but i've done it multiple times and i've tried multiple blades where i just drove one channel it's not something that's audible it's pretty much academic if you look that blip is still below 0.005 percent thd plus n i can't explain it but i measured it so i'm going to report it and it's repeatable at least with my test fixture so like I was saying, this is the first amplifier I've ever seen with one channel or seven channels driven. You get the same power. I just thought that was pretty cool. Then we look at the power sweep with two channels driven at four ohms. And we're getting 427 watts at 0.1%, 457 watts at 1%. That's above spec. I mean, that's just awesome. That's a lot of power to give you on an amplifier that drives 16 channels. Very impressed by that. Now, I wasn't able to do uh, seven channels at four ohms. In fact, that would just consume way more than the breaker is capable of delivering. Because don't forget, this is a consumer product and 
if you have a 15 or 20 amp line, you're not getting 400 watts by seven. You're just not, it doesn't work out. So then I did a two channel bridge test. So if you have, if you have a 16 channel amp and you only have, you know, 11 speakers, you still have extra channels. You can go and bridge your front channels and get more power. The theoretical to getting, uh, more power with bridge it should get up to four times more power if the power supply is really robust and the amplifier is really robust as well very few amplifiers that are bridgeable give you four times the power the yamaha two channel amp that i just did a video on that's ten thousand dollars that one gives you four times the power but this is not the case where you could do that here you're getting twice the power and i want to show you that here and it's quite beastly actually you're getting a little bit more you're getting 519 watts when, when you bridge one blade at 0.1% and 550 watts at 1%. And look at the distortion curve. I mean, it's very linear out to about, maybe I'd say about 400 watts. So this thing is a beast when it's bridged, uh, when you're driving an eight ohm load. That's awesome amount of power right there. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to talk about the Cyanad. So the Cyanad um, on these graphs, we're very good, very low distortion. As I said, look at the distortion levels here. It's like 0.002%, which is like 96 dB sine ed. That's a really good result for a multi-channel, oh, multi-channel power amplifier. And the same thing runs true with uh, when I run it in bridge mode. We're still close to uh, 95, 96 dB sine ed here. Very good result. This is definitely, if you have extra channels left over, this is something I definitely recommend you do if your speakers are nominal six ohms or higher. They even tell you if you have a four ohm speaker, you should not bridge because it's gonna just take a lot more current than the amplifier is capable of doing. But I did it anyway and I checked it and um, yeah. So we got 596 watts of 0.1 and 612 at 1%. That's not a whole lot more power than we were driving at four at eight ohms. So you could see that this thing is really current limiting. Now I can't tell you to do that if you have four ohm speakers. I personally, I'm running a Paralyson S7T speakers, and they're four ohm, um, and they're pretty high sensitivity. And I've been running them bridged without any problems, full range. But I can't tell you guys that you should be doing that because when I ran the sweep test at four ohms bridged. It shut off and actually all the lights on the porthole turned red and you know i forgot i was going to put a video clip on that here but it was quite a theatrical experience seeing the thing you know blinking red like that um i can't tell you guys if you have really low impedance speakers if they're four ohms and they dip down below 3.2 ohms um be cautious about bridging at that case what I did in my configuration is I'm running a nine speak nine channel speaker configuration and two subs in my family room with this system. So I ran all of my bed channels, the five channels, I bridged those. And then the Atmos speakers, the four Atmos speakers, I ran single uh, amplified. And I've been having a great time with it. It's just been a powerhouse, it's been very clean, very linear. So here's the interesting thing. When we look at the dynamic power, like I was telling you before, because they rate this as a 200 watt amp, and because the power supply is regulated, there's no dynamic headroom. I pretty much get the same power with when I do a dynamic burst test as I do when I do a sweep or continuous test. So there's just no headroom when, you, when you're rating the amplifier up to the rails like that and it's a regulated supply, there's a trade-off there. And I even talk about that here. So if you rate the amplifier as a 200 watt amp, there's no headroom. But if you rate it as 125 watts, which is what I was saying before the knee, then you can say this amplifier has two and a half dB of headroom. Then you can have all this bragging rights saying, wow, look at that. We've exceeded our spec. We have more dynamics. So, you know, it's really a philosophical question on how the amplifier should be rated. Um, what I do notice is with linear amplifiers, when they tell you it's a 200 watt amp, a multi-channel amp, and they use a large centralized power supply, you tend to get more power with you when you're driving one or two channels versus driving five to seven channels because the power supply itself is not regulated. You have more available power on tap, so you get more headroom in that case. So you are trading headroom when you regulate a power supply. And then I just have the power tables here, you know, the continuous full power bandwidth. Yes, it's 200 watts, but there are with two channels driven. That's great. Uh, I derated it. 
um, with five channels driven. I derated it to 172 watts, so there was no dips in the low frequencies, but that's still impressive. With five, five channels driven, I got 172 watts. Seven channels driven, I got 146 watts. This is at 0.1%. And of course, uh, when I drove it at four ohms, continuous full power bandwidth, it was almost 400 watts a channel. And then, like I said, the power sweeps with eight ohms, whether it was one channel or seven channels driven, 215 at 0.1%, 226 at 1%. And you can just see here, bridged 550 watts at eight ohms, 519 at eight ohms at 0.1% barely got a little bit more power with uh, forum drive and it just was not something that i would recommend and the dynamic power again if you look at the dynamic power seven channels driven is 220 watts look at it here it's basically the same no headroom at all when you rate this as a uh, 200 watt amplifier and then i want to look at the signal to noise ratio what i do is i it's a dynamic range test i run um i run it at one watt because that's where the power amplifier really needs to be quiet because that, you know, low level signals that you listen to most of the time hover around one to five watts. I got between 91 to 95 dB SNR, which is fantastic. Anything above 80, even 90 dB is, is great. That's a very quiet amplifier. Now, Morantz claims that they were able to get another 6 dB more signal to noise ratio. I'm not sure what happened there. I don't know if it's um, the fact that maybe they were using the unbalanced input and had an extra 6 dB boost, and I used the XLR input, and that would make sense. So maybe their measurement was at 2 watts, mine was at 1. But it, suffice it to say, I'm happy with this result. This is a great result. Very few multi-channel amplifiers give you 90 dB at 1 watt. They usually give you about 80 dB. And again, I'm not showing you this at full power. I'm showing you at 1 watt because you could calculate any amplifier's SNR back to one watt and do an apples to apples comparison here. And that's why I always do that. And then the crosstalk is awesome. Um, I ran all channels as a disturber and I measured the channel that didn't have the disturber. And I think it's uh, 70 dB at 20 kilohertz. I think anything above 60 dB at 20 K is fine. You could see at one kilohertz, it's like 90 dB. So that's really good. And then to put, again, to put things into perspective, what other options do you have for 16 channel amplifiers? I've got one. I've got one in my theater room. It's Storm Audio. It's a great amplifier. It uses the um, the Pascal module with a 3,200 watt power supply. Yes, that's a more powerful amplifier than this, but it's like $12,000. So it's a significant step up in price. And Trinov has their own version, which uses a very similar uh, Ice Edge Class D module, but they also have a very large power supply on theirs. And they have the ability to bridge as well. The Storm Audio 16 channel amp is not bridgeable. You got to go with their eight channel bridged amp if you want to have more power. All great amplifiers. Those are three, these are three of the best 16 channel amplifiers on the market. The Marantz comes out to be the cheapest and it gives you very commendable performance. I'm really happy with all the results here. Yeah, I, I picked some nits with some of the stuff that I found, but I mean, come on. This is the first time I've seen Marantz do an amplifier that gives you as much power with all channels driven as one channel driven. So you got to commend them on that. It runs moderately warm. It doesn't get super hot, nothing like, you know, their receivers and nothing like a linear amplifiers, but it does get a little heated. Uh, so you should give some good ventilation to it. I think it's a beautifully constructed amplifier. And so far, I've really liked the way it's been driving my Paralyson and Paradigm speaker system. And I'm going to be doing more coverage of this amplifier. I'm going to do a formal review of the separates, and I'll give you more of my listening conditions. But overall, this is a, a actually a very high-value multi-channel amp. And if you need something that breaks the nine-channel barrier and you want it in one box, I really can't think of a better example at this price that beats this. So guys, I hope you liked this video. Please give me a thumb up. Hit the subscribe button. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get more access if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.